All right, everyone. So at this point, uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, theoretical talking and what software you need and some tips and advice and such. Uh, and so the next thing is we will actually get hands-on because even if you brought your device today, we're not going to quite use it just yet. I do want to address creating virtual devices because, again, if I want to test this on a tablet, I'm not going to go out and buy a tablet, but I can make a virtual device. So here under uh, my instructions, I've got it set up that we're going to set up a virtual device. And what we're going to do is find our virtual device manager inside of that same folder where we saw the SDK manager. Well, the SDK manager serves a couple of purposes. One is that you've got this SDK manager to update your code. But the other purpose is to manage your virtual devices. So I've still got my SDK manager open. I have not closed it yet, and I didn't really make any changes here. We don't need to in this class. What we do need to do every time we come in, and so we'll get used to it, is to create a virtual device. And so we go up to the top here. Let's go to the Tools menu and select Manage AVDs, Android Virtual Devices. So select Manage, AVDs, and you get this screen with two tabs. One will show you all of your existing Android virtual devices, and the other are sort of templates to create the devices. Uh, so let's switch over to the tab of Device Definitions. And here's the templates. So because we've got one of the later versions of Android, We've got, well, would you like to make a virtual device that is Android TV, like a 1080p screen, 55 inches? Mm -hmm. We can also make a, an Android Wear device, either square or round. We can make a generic Galaxy Nexus or a Nexus 10 or 7, etc. Nexus 1, we can have some more, even more generic, you know, 3.3-inch screens all the way down to, well, they're not really in order, but here's a tablet 10 inches. And then if you, if you look at a certain point, you'll see like the lowest end device, which is a 2.7 inch QVGA generic one. So in my instructions here, and my recommendation when you, get, when you go home, is to create a medium level, medium to low level one, which is this one here, the 3.2 inch QVGA ADP2 generic 3.2 inch screen. It's not an official, like, branded Nexus or whatever. It's just a generic Android device, 3.2 inches. So it's, it's going to be smaller than this one. It's going to be kind of like classic iPhone-sized. It's not that big, but this is the thing. Again, you don't know how powerful your computer really is until you start to do this. Because I would not recommend right away, let me make this 10-inch tablet. And then it runs frame by frame, like one frame per second, super slow. You want to start with a low-end device and then go higher and higher to see what your computer can handle. Because for some people, they tell me, I selected this you know, 4-inch device, and as soon as I click it, my computer crashes. So every computer is different. We're all going to do this one together, and we're going to see how it runs. Uh, so again, select the 3.2-inch QVGA ADP2, click it once. And then on the right side, select Create AVD. So we're going to create an AVD based on this template. There's a bunch of things that could be filled out here. My notes tell you which ones you should change. You don't need to change the name. That's fine. Uh, this is going to be a 3.2 inch. We're not going to change that. Uh, if we had different versions of Android API installed, we could activate that because then it'll give us a different skin. It'll give us the latest version if we select API 20. We never installed it, so it doesn't show up there. But at home, you can show different skins, different versions of your Android interface if you select the target. CPU. Again, this is like I'm speaking English and want to speak to someone in Portuguese, but I talk to someone in Italian first. And uh, by default, many of these devices have an ARM CPU. 
it's just a different type of CPU than our Intel CPU. So we could download the ARM system image. Not recommended because, again, it's different translations. So we're going to download a, a system image of Intel, it's already done for us, that aligns better with our Intel CPU and therefore runs our virtual device a lot faster. You know, when I swipe through this thing, it swipes pretty, pretty well, and I zoom in and do everything, and it's pretty responsive. You're going to see that your virtual device might be much slower, especially if you have an older device. Even if you've got 6 gigs of RAM with an i3, it still might be slower than this little old thing because it's just a different architecture. One way that to help speed it up is to select Intel Atom right here. I don't want to have to point and click to click the keys on the virtual keyboard so we can use our real keyboard. We're going to be able to type on the keyboard and it'll be like typing on the screen. So we have hardware keyboard present. Keep it on. Skin. I recommend you select skin with dynamic hardware controls. Because a real device has hardware controls. Volume up volume down, home button, power button, maybe a few more. To get those sorts of buttons on our virtual device, we should activate this, the skin with dynamic hardware controls. This device has a uh, front-facing camera, or has a, has a back, has a rear-facing camera, this is the front, has a rear-facing camera, but not a front-facing. Um, I don't think it does. No, it does. Yeah, right there. And this virtual device has the ability to, to have a, a back camera. And you have the option of emulated or webcam. Now, I have a webcam here for the lecture, and probably on your laptop you have a webcam built in. So if you select webcam, you will be able to use your virtual device and have it take pictures for the full um, testing of that feature. If you don't have an, a real webcam, you can select emulate it and it'll still work, although it'll be pretty anticlimactic. It's just a little square moving inside another square. That's a photo. In order for the camera to work, it needs to save its pictures to an SD card. Uh, you know, I've got an SD memory card in this. We'll look at this right here, internal storage SD card. And I recommend you put in an SD card, you insert an SD card of any size, but just because it's easier to type with one hand, 99, 99 megabytes. We're not going to take a lot of photos, so we don't need a, you know, we don't need a 16 gigabyte memory card, 99 megabytes, that's fine. I don't recommend that you change your memory options because this is the default template for this device. So this is going to take half a gigabyte of RAM on top of all the other gigs your system's already using. That's why it's recommended to try to run this stuff on a computer that is pretty well equipped. So I'm not changing the memory options, I'm not changing the internal options, 200 megabytes, pretty small, but doesn't really matter. And then we have two options here. I'm not going to turn on either of them just yet, but I will say that as you do this at home, and even if you installed Haxum, the hardware accelerator, let's say that still that things still run really slow. One possible way to speed things up is to activate Use Host GPU, because then your virtual device will tap into your graphics processor, not just your central processor. And I have found that does help. I've tried running a 10-inch tablet emulator without GPU, and it runs not too well. And I turn on the GPU and it and it runs well. It run it wakes up. So I'm not gonna turn it on just yet. This is overkill for this type of device. But for a more powerful device, you might use it. We won't need snapshots just yet, but that basically is a very cool feature where we can uh, we can work on our virtual device, install something to it, save a snapshot, and sort of freeze it as is then continue to work on the device and do different things and oops I made a mistake I broke it we can revert to that snapshot it's like kind of like an undo it'll take us back to a previous version of our app using a snapshot we don't need it just yet so I won't turn it on and again everything that I'm talking about is in my instructions here so let's click OK it'll tell you what you did 
cool. Click OK. It takes us back to the tab of Android virtual devices. I've got one virtual device set up. Select it, and on the right side, click Start. It pops up with a few other things I'll get back to in a moment. Just click Launch. And now it's going to tell us what it's doing. It's starting the emulator. It's going to start the emulator. You're going to wait a moment. Eventually, you're going to get an icon that appears. Just wait for that to load up. Does anyone see like a like a splash screen loading up in Android splash screen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Keep waiting just a moment. Mm -hmm. You guys are playing with me. So you're seeing eventually a screen that says interesting. I'm gonna let mine catch up and then I'll, I'll join. <coughs> Okay, as a little digression here, I've got my resource monitor turned on here just to show you that, um, and yeah, I'm running my, my recorder, but you should also see this when you do this on your own computer, that you're running this, this little device on your big old computer, but it's still going to make your CPU work hard, it's going to suck up your RAM, it's going to make your hard drive spin up, because you're running a whole little computer inside of your main computer. Even if it's a, even if it fits in your pocket. So once you have your screen that it says welcome, go ahead and click on that with the mouse. Don't touch the monitor. It doesn't have touch screen. So what you want to do is take a moment. There we go. Uh, you want to, uh, it's going to load up, it's going to, it's going to be a real device. You're going to use it as if, when mine loads up, I'll show you. So on my real device, I can, I can swipe over to go from screen to screen. Well, I can do that also here with the mouse, so try this. Click and hold and swipe to the left, and that swipes to the, my next desktop. Just like here, I'm swiping over to my next desktop. Swipe to the left, which is click with the mouse, hold and go to the left. If you do have a laptop with touch capabilities, which I do, then you can touch the screen and use it like a real Android device. It's cool. But here, okay, I'm swiping around. Cool. On my um, on my virtual device, I've also I'm on my real device. I've got my apps. I've got a button for my apps, which here it's this little button in the middle. Click your apps drawer, right there. And that loads up right here. These are all your apps. Click OK. And then swipe around. All right, so I'm just kind of swiping around a little bit, looking at this Android device. OK, on my real device, or even on iPhone or any device, if I want to go back to the home screen, what do I do? Press the home button, right? There's no home button here. Yes, there is. There's a home button right here. Click your home button. It takes you back to your home screen. So there's a home button right there. There's volume buttons right here. Volume down, volume up. There's a power button. Let's try this for a moment, just like on my real device. Power it down, click power. The screen goes to sleep. Just like a real device. 
I press the power button here and it wakes up and what does it do on my real device? Ask me to unlock it or put a password. Same thing here. Press the power button again and it pops up, unlock it. How do you think you unlock this? Swipe. But just don't slide to unlock because that's an Apple patent. What you want to do is click and drag. You know, click from the center to the lock, to the lock ring, unlocked. So imagine you've got a finger there and you're swiping it. Um, on Android, we have a, a menu button. On my device here, it's like three little lines. On another device that I have, it looks like a half sheet of paper. So on your real device, if you have an Android device, you know that you can type that menu button and you get some menu items. Same thing here, menu button. So I can change my wallpaper, system settings. So this is acting just like a real device. Feels a little bit slower for me. Of course, I'm running my recorder, so that eats up my RAM. But as you use these devices, how do you feel the responsiveness? Good, bad, or in the middle? Pretty good. And this is running a pretty medium to low-end device. So then what an Android device also has is a back button. I can press back here and it just takes me back. I've got a back button on the virtual one as well. So try this. Go to the web. Oh, find the web browser and go to your favorite website and browse the web a little bit from this virtual device. This is actually connected to the internet. It's taking the capabilities of your host computer and taking the internet connection and lets you browse a computer or browse websites. So try it. It's, it's not it's not easy to take this stuff and to take it home. You should do it at home because these files are getting installed into different folders. I can show you where the folder is and you can try to take it, but I haven't had good experience moving that from the computer to the disk. The list is all in there. But if you look at number two over here, I think you can list it in All right, so this is our virtual device. This is um, this is a, a basic virtual device, and what we're going to do is use it as we as we proceed in the class. Now, uh, it didn't take that long, relatively speaking, to to load up, but I recommend that you don't close the device. You can put it to sleep if you want, but I don't recommend that you exit out of the app because once we test our projects and we want to test it on the virtual device, we're going to have to wait for it to load up. So a little bit of a time saver, especially if you're running a more powerful virtual device, is don't close the virtual device. Usually I keep my virtual device running and just leave it on the home screen. And you can run more than one device. At the moment, I, I don't recommend it, but if you want to try it, you can go back to your device manager and run another instance of that same device. Or you can create another virtual device. On your own, you can try to see, well, can this handle a Galaxy Nexus, which is a 4.7-inch device with 1 gig of RAM? We used half a gig of RAM. So when you're at home, you could see how does it run with all of these. And you can start to experiment with the Google Wear, the Android Wear device. It's going to be a nice, it's going to be a little round 
virtual device. It doesn't really do much because it needs voice commands and I haven't gotten it to work. So um, that's that. And I haven't been able to get this Android TV to work yet because I don't have a 55-inch monitor. But uh, any questions so far? This is one of our things that we're going to use throughout the class. Yes? Can we download uh, some apps on this emulator? Um, I don't know if it can go that far, because I don't see that if I go to my apps here. I don't believe we've got the Google Play Store, do we? It didn't work for me. Yeah, I, I don't even see the Google Play Store here. So um, I don't think we'll be able to do that. Uh, we can, what is known as sideloading, we can we can install an app that we have, but we have to do it through uh, through the through the command line. And I don't have any documentation on that, but you can look it up. But you can install your app directly to a virtual device via the command line. No, because it's still too much of a virtual device. Because Google Play needs an account, and I don't know if it can let you go through the whole step. You can you can try it out for me. But I don't know if you'll be able to install real apps. Oh. What we're going to do is we're going to use Eclipse eventually. We're going to write our app, we're going to run our app, and it's going to get installed to our virtual device or our real device. And that's how we're going to install our apps to the devices. So this is what I previewed briefly on one of the days in the last month. Remember that? I was showing you some Android device. That's, that was it right there. I created a virtual device, I, I fired it up, and I used it. You can browse the web and, and, and all of that. For example, remember, and you can use the keyboard here, remember? You don't have to click a virtual keyboard. Remember in the previous class, our example project was vmcampus.com slash sdce. If you go there on your virtual device's browser, it will, it will do that, uh, that JavaScript detection that we talked about. Remember, we were testing it. Are we on a virtual? Are we on an Android device or a real device? And since we were, are on a desktop, and since we were on the desktop, it was showing us the desktop version of the project. Well, here's how we can test if it works with a with an Android device. Because if I go there, it should detect I'm on Android, and it goes directly to the mobile version. That was the point of that. All right, so let's uh, go back to the, um, as I said, I'm not going to close my virtual device. I'm just going to take it home, click home, and then maybe minimize it. Just get it out of the way. You've got bigger monitors than me, so maybe just put it in the corner. No one puts Android in the corner. Then we'll go back to um, our virtual device manager here. Just close the, the virtual device manager. We want to free up some RAM because we're going to be, as I said, we're running a mini computer inside our computer. So we're going to close the virtual device manager. Close that. That takes us back to the SDK manager. We're done with that. Close that. And I'm going to leave my virtual device in the corner here. So when you get home, what you want to do is, is try this out on your computer. Create that virtual device, run it, and compare. You know, Use your memory to compare. Is my home computer's virtual device running as smoothly as the one here? We've got i5s, I think, 4 gigs of RAM or so, and they seem to run fine. So test it on your home computer. If it doesn't work, make sure you've installed Haxum. And if that still doesn't run very well, try using that host GPU check mark, which we'll look at again to remind you. But what I want to do now is provide you another PDF with more instructions.
So if you go back to the network drive, I put in a brand new file there, number three. I forgot to convert it to Word, but hopefully that will cause no problem. Um, go back to your network drive and then get sheet number three. And again, you can print during the lab time if you want these on paper. And what we'll talk about here, copy number three and then open it up. So once again, uh, if you're new to the class, you get that by going to Computer Window, the Network Drive Z, or Z, open that up, and then you'll see Campos Android 2, and you'll see number 3. Copy instructions number three to your desktop. So this almost fits on one sheet, but it's a few more things here. So now we're going to talk about Eclipse. Eclipse is our IDE, Integrated Development Environment. It's where we'll write, a, we'll, where we'll write out code and then deploy, I should say, where we'll write our code and then deploy our projects to real or virtual devices. The following steps make editing HTML easier. Um, so let's actually look at what Eclipse is. Back in the same folder where we, back, back on our ADT folder, so it's on the C drive, the ADT bundle folder, it's got two big folders, two big things. All of the SDK, all of the source code, the virtual device manager, you want to go back into that. And then we've also got Eclipse. So again, if you've already got Eclipse and you install this, it's going to give you a different copy of Eclipse that does not conflict with your current Eclipse. Um, so open Eclipse, Eclipse folder. It's in the same folder as the SDK manager. And then we get eclipse.exe, and again, this didn't install itself to the to the to the control panel or to the start menu. It's in that folder. But what you could do if you're on Windows, you can right click, and you've got the option of either this is Windows 7, but you can right click and pin to the taskbar or the start menu. So if you do select pin to start menu, if you right click the eclipse.exe, the executable and then um, pin to start menu, now you'll have it in your start menu. It doesn't, it doesn't get there automatically. Or you can put it in the taskbar. It's down there. All right, so let's open the Eclipse exe file. The first thing that pops up here is where would you like to save your projects? So the way this class will work throughout the, the month, throughout the semester, is that we'll be doing some work and you probably want to take the work with you and keep doing it at home. What I'm going to do also is my work that I end up with at the end of the day, I'll put it into that network folder with the date. So you can start on my project next time you come back. Or you can take my code and double check it because you might have you might have a problem with your code. So this, pay attention here, this is where it's saving your project. The default is user lab workspace. It's gonna save it into your 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 folder in here about lab in workspace. You could, if you want, I suppose, browse and select your flash drive. I don't recommend it just yet. 
because I've found problems with trying to load my project from day to day, because this always forgets what you do. So even though we tell it, save my project on my, on, my, on my flash drive, and when we come back next time and tell it again, use that folder on my flash drive, there were still other little configuration files that were not saved when we went to your flash drive. So when we come back day by day, it's still going to get a little confused. So I don't recommend to tell this, save it to my flash drive. What I'll recommend is at the end of the day, I'll remind all of us, let's go to the workspace folder and copy the project to our flash drive. It's a little more cumbersome, but obviously on this lab it's necessary. When you do this at home, you do this one time and all your projects get saved there, no problem. So I'm going to keep it on the default. I recommend keep it on the default. Click OK. He's going to load up Eclipse version Juno. Anyone get that joke? Anyone read Star Wars The Expanded Universe? No? Never mind. So, here we get Eclipse. This is our editing tool. Uh, at the top it says uh, we're running Eclipse on top of Java. Again, Java and Ant and stuff is in the background. We never really deal much with it. But it's behind everything. That's why it's important to have this set up. So we've got Eclipse. And then we've got this screen that has a lot of panels and sub-panels and windows with sub-windows and there's a lot to do and look at with Eclipse. It's very easy to get lost. As a quick overview, we have, of course, a menu at the top, file, search, run, etc. File menu, no problem. We've got a row of icons, these, these default icons. We can create projects, save projects, print code, etc. Notice here, at the, at the top, we've got two buttons here. One is the Android SDK Manager and one is the AVD Manager. So you've got quick access to your Virtual Device Manager and your SDK Manager. So you can open Eclipse and then select to open your virtual devices straight from here. Although this is what I'm saying about things are rough around the edges. Uh, why does it have the wrong icon? I clicked on that one and here's the icon, but that's that icon. Oh well, maybe in the next version they'll fix it. Although they haven't for like five. So a bunch of rows of icons. Um, we're going to look at this in detail later, but we're going to have code, we're going to write our code, we're going to see our result. In the previous class, we were using Notepad++ to write our HTML code, and in that class we went to run, or launch or whatever, run Firefox, and we saw the result. Here, in Eclipse, we've also got a run, and we've, we've got a handy button run. So make a note that there's a couple of ways to run our project. And here we're going to be able to select run on a virtual device, run on a real device, run on my 10-inch device, run on my 4-inch device. It's going to be under run, and we're going to list, have a list of run configurations. Or, handier shortcut is right here, this little run button with the run configurations. Nothing here yet, we haven't gotten there yet. On the left side is the Package Explorer, which is basically a list of all of your apps. Every app that we're working with, we can work with more than one. They'll all be listed here like folders, like a, like a normal Windows Explorer folder tree, like this. All your apps will be listed right there, and all of the files. You can close panels, rearrange panels. If you close the Package Explorer panel, it goes away. If you want to bring it back, any panel that you close, you can bring it back by going to the Window, Menu, Show, View, and bring the panel back. So, oops, I closed the net in the page. The Package Explorer, people do this all the time because they think they're closing their project, but they close the whole panel. You can get it back from Window, Show, View, Package Explorer. In the center of the screen is the spot where we'll be writing our code usually, 
that's where it'll show us our JavaScript or HTML or CSS in the middle here. Uh, if we're dealing with a, with a code view, it'll show us the code. If we're dealing with a design view, it'll show us the icons. It'll kind of give us a preview of our project. On the right side is the outline panel if we need to deal with various parameters or the various uh, pieces of our project, they'll be listed there. And then at the bottom is a panel with several sub-panels or tabs. Uh, we've got the Problems tab, which we'll probably look a lot at because it'll tell us how our project has a problem. And we have various types of problems. We have warnings and errors. If we've got a warning, our project will probably still run and we probably want to fix the warning. But our project will still run. If we've got an error, our project will not run. We need to fix it, definitely. So here it'll tell us what is the problem, where can we find it in what file, what line number is it under. So we can find it. And what's cool also is that when we get a problem here, we'll be able to right-click, and there'll be an option here that says, Help me fix it. And it'll give you a little pop-up that says what the problem might be and a solution. We hardly look at the Java doc screen, don't worry. We hardly look at decoration, and we look at console a lot. Console, how does that sound familiar? Inspector. That inspector in, in, in when we were working with JavaScript in the web browser. So if we write something that says console.log, you know, uh, alert or whatever, we would see it there. We w it would pop up there kind of like the console in the web browser. Um, what's also useful here is that this gives you feedback as to what your project is doing. So when, we're, when we go to run and we launch the project, I want to keep an eye out down here because it'll say compiling HTML, compiling whatever, installing app, launching app, error, or success. So the console here will tell us, will give us good feedback. That's a general overview of the different screens of Eclipse. We're going to create a basic Android project in a moment, and then we're going to run it in the emulator. Actually, on my instructions here, I've got a section about setting up a little bit of a plugin. We don't quite need it yet, so I'm going to skip it. There's a section in here which we will do right here. Uh, right here. There's this section. We'll, we'll do it, not just yet. If you did it, that's fine. I'm not going to do it yet. But this is adding a plugin to make writing HTML code easier. Because Eclipse can write just about every kind of code Java, C, PHP, HTML. But just like Notepad, what was the big benefit of writing code in Notepad? Colors, color coding. color coding, code highlighting, code completion. By default, Eclipse does not have that built in for HTML. It has it for other languages. But if we want color coding and code collapsing and all of that stuff of a civilized text editor, these are the steps to activate that. And we will, but not just yet. We're not going to edit HTML just yet. What we'll do is create a basic Android project. As I said, Eclipse can be used to create just about any kind of project, oftentimes a Java project. Now, pop quiz, true or false? Java and JavaScript are just about the same. False. False. Their names are very similar, but that's it. Their code is not compatible. I'm sure there's a history we can look up on Wikipedia about how, what, why did they use the same name almost, but Java and JavaScript are not the same. If I write a command in JavaScript, it doesn't really translate to Java. That's why the whole purpose of my classes, I could teach a class on creating Android apps the native way, which is via Java. And we can create our Java-based Android app, and it'll work. But then when we get to the point where we also want to distribute our app on iTunes for, for iPhone, we have to reprogram our whole app because you don't make iPhone apps in Java. You make them in Objective-C, completely different language. And let's say we learn Objective-C and spend months on that and then, okay, reprogram our app from Java because the native programming language of Android is Java. And now I've learned Objective-C, so I'm on, I'm on iPhone also. And I want to tap into that growing market of a Windows phone. I have to reprogram my app for C-sharp 
another programming language. So that's why I'm teaching these classes in HTML. We're using this more universal language. It has its pros and cons. But via other things we're going to learn, specifically Cordova, we're going to be able to translate our code, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, into Java, basically. And then our app will become an Android app. And we can take that same core code and translate it again via Cordova, but using the Apple programming interface, Xcode, and convert it into an iPhone app. And take that same core code and use Cordova and use the Windows Phone programming interface Visual Basic or Visual Studio and make it in a Windows app. But first we're going to start off making a very basic Java-based Android app. So let's go up to the File menu, New, Android Application Project. If you were previously using Eclipse, you probably don't have that. You don't have that little menu item because you downloaded a version of Eclipse that wasn't designed to make uh, an Android app. Perhaps it was designed to make Java apps, and a Java app is like a Windows app, or a Mac app, or a Linux app. It's a, it's a desktop app, often. And so our Google-branded version of Eclipse has the Android application project template. Go ahead and select that. We have several screens we're going to look at here. New Android app. Enter an application name, shown in launcher. What's the launcher? This thing right here. On my virtual device. These are my apps. They all have a name. This is where we type that name, application name. And notice you can put your mouse over these info buttons and they give you some info here and there. But anyway, at the moment we're just going to practice and make a project called test01. I can use spaces, I can use capital letters, I should use capital letters, unless I'm going for an E.E. E. Cummings vibe, I suppose. And so we're using capital letters, application name, that's what's going to appear on the app launcher right here. So you can write My Amazing App by Victor Campos. But uh, do you think you're going to have enough space for it? Even with a 10-inch tablet. That's why you see so many apps out there with like one word long names. Or a couple of words or something that fits within the space, and I can't tell you how long to make it because, again, we're going to deal with the universe of Android apps, uh, Android devices, 3-inch devices, 10-inch devices, everything in between. So we're just going to call this for the moment Test1. That's the name that appears below the icon. Project name is the name that appears internally here in Eclipse when you've got a bunch of apps set up. They're going to show up here. And notice it automatically writes it for you without the space. No space on the project name. Package name. This is the name that Google Play or Amazon App Store will care about. Because we can have, and we know that there are many calculator apps out there, right? You can download many calculator apps, many uh, note-taking apps, many tip calculator apps. There's lots of apps out there that have maybe even the same name, calculator. Well, how can they all be uh, named Calculator if, if they should have a unique name? The package name is what keeps them unique. There might be 10 Calculator apps, but there's only one Calculator app called campos.com.victor.calculator. So here what we need to write is a reverse URL, victor.com. We write it com dot victor dot the name of our app. So let's write our last name here. You don't have to have a real website with your name. You can have a dot net, a dot org, whatever. Doesn't quite matter for us today. Eventually it will. But this is just some sort of um, identifier for the hundreds of how many are there? Hundreds of millions of apps, Android apps. 
out there. This is to identify your app from everyone else's. And a way often to do it is the name of your website. If you don't have a website, you can make one up. We're making one up. We're putting our last name. But there could, there could ultimately lead to problems if there's someone else that has that website, right? It could, yeah. So when we deal with this later, more in the distribution aspect of the, of the, of the course, uh, we do need to address that, that, um, you know, get a domain name with your name. Like, I often make my apps with my company name, which is PMD Interactive. No one has that. We bought it. And so our project is com.pmdinteractive. You know, um, portfolio, or whatever the name of our app is. We all need a unique package name there. You notice that it ends in the name of your app, no spaces, no capitals. And here we deal with, well, what uh, range of Android devices are we going to deal with? Because there's a big range of devices. We can go look at a chart to see what the demographics currently show, but there's a huge uh, p uh, couple of pie pieces about what version of Android. So here we're saying, at minimum, our app can run on Android API 8, Android 2.2, codename Foyo. And at the maximum, it can run on Android API 21, 4.x, which might eventually be 4.5 L preview. And we're going to use the code base, the source code, to compile with Android 4.4 KitKat API 19. So we're going to be able to target a huge range of devices. If we don't want to target such old devices, then we can easily say the minimum type of device is, and here's a list of all of the code names if you didn't know them, uh, only the latest uh, from 4.0 and up. I don't want to deal with those old devices, the 2.2 range. Yes. So how can you target uh, L if you're compiling with 4.4? Good question. I have to look up why that is able to, to work. Because we're going to use the existing code, and I'm sure there's going to be new APIs and such, but I guess they're compatible, the old ones are compatible with the new ones, so for some reason so it works. So basically you use only those API calls that you let out common across all yeah, we won't even have access to the API 21, so we're only going to really be able to use code that, that works for API 19. And API, the newer versions can usually handle the older versions, I suppose, so that's why we can do that. Uh, this should work, um, but we can, of course, say, well, only target up to 19 because that's all I know what to write. I haven't even worked with 21 yet, so I won't target 20, 21 yet. I think we'll be fine if we keep it on 21, but if not, we can just go back and change it. Yes? It seems to me that these uh, uh, minimums and, uh, and maximums uh, are going to, of course, have different features available to them. Mm -hmm. And some of that's going to depend a lot on the code that we write. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, you know, if we use a feature, oh, well, that's going to suddenly change our minimum from being uh, Froyo to, uh, to something much more recent. That's and, true. And so we'll, uh, it seems very prescriptive at this stage, but how do we, uh, how do we manage that for the purpose of uh, 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 publishing the, uh, uh, the app? That really depends on what you're trying to do with your app. At the moment, uh, just to see how this works, we're choosing a very wide range, but eventually what we're going to do is we are going to use a database uh, a database uh, foundation that does not work on older versions of Android. So we will need to narrow our APIs to run on the newer 4.0 and up. So we need to decide what are we going to do with our app and what what code, what APIs am I going to use to know how low I can target. So here it shows this wide range will target 95% of the market. And if I were to put it on just 4.0 and up, it drops, it didn't seem to drop, it's still at 95. I suppose if we go newer, 
supposed to change. That's supposed to tell us how much of the market we are targeting if we if we if we uh, narrow it down. So eventually we will target 4.0 and up because our, our code is, is too new for the old devices. We've got theme here, not too many to choose from, doesn't matter because we're gonna we're gonna we've got our own design of our project already, right? We did it in the previous class. We designed it with HTML and Java and CSS. We use jQuery Mobile. We've got an interface set up that, of course, we can continue to tweak. So this won't uh, doesn't have much bearing for us just yet. But I'll leave it as hollow light with dark action bar. We'll see how that looks like a little later. In what way? They add a lot of code, and if you have messing up with your apps, etc., they will be problematic. I've actually found that to be the case too, because I've done this in another class, uh -huh. and it just because I chose a different name and code looked like completely. But were you designing a native in native code uh, in Java that. itself? Yeah. So well. <laughs> what's happening, what we're going to do in ours, since we're working with HTML, we're kind of going to override this anyway. We've got our own interface, so it might be a moot point, but we'll keep an eye, an eye out for it. I'm going to leave that default for the moment. Next. Uh, here we've got uh, things we don't really need to change. Do we want to create a custom icon? Um, you know, all of our all of our apps have an icon. Do we want to create an icon? Yeah, we do want that. We've got an uh, create an activity, which is basically each screen full of content or each screen of our of our app. Do we want to create at least one screen for our app? Yeah, leave that there. Uh, we can work with libraries and such. We don't need to yet. Sort of use them as a use this project as a as a template in a way. We don't need that. We can change where we're saving our project. But the default is in the workspace that I defined when we when we turned on Eclipse, so that's fine. I'm not going to work with work. I'm not going to deal with working sets, so I didn't change anything here. Next, and here's the part. Well, if we've got our own icon, we can set it up here. We don't have an icon exactly handy, and not exactly like what we want to work with because we made an icon previously, but not exactly for Android. Because notice. Here, we should have different versions for different devices, different versions of DPI, dots per inch, the, the resolution of our screen. So for example, an MDPI, an HDPI, XHDPI, XHDPI, all of these have different sizes. We haven't dealt with that yet, so I'm not going to change anything here, but here's something fun we could do. Notice we can say show an image, clip art. Or text. Let's play with this. Select text. And what you can do here is you can create a, an app launcher icon that's got maybe your initials. So just to test this, select text, and I'm going to type my initials. And so that's the icon that's going to appear, and I can play with a different font. I'm going to use Bauhaus in 93. And then you can even do this. I'm going to put a circle behind it. So I can make a very simple app launcher icon by just playing with the text, with the text feature. So let me give you 30 seconds or so to play with that and then we'll move on.
so obviously we could spend a little time on this, but whatever you have now is fine. I'm going to click Next. We have some templates to display uh, uh, templates uh, to uh, to give a, a style to our project blank activity notice it says it creates a new blank activity with an action bar so you can have a bar at the top to select actions blank activity with a fragment empty activity full screen etc so we've got a few kind of uh, templates that we can do our project at we'll don't really need to deal with any of these, but on my notes I'm suggesting for the moment just select an empty activity. I think empty is more basic than blank. So select empty activity. Next. And if we wanted to change the name of the activity, that screen, because we might refer to it in code in other ways, we can do that here. Uh, this is the class that is being created, but defaults are fine. Don't worry, I'll select Finish. So what's going to happen here is take a keep an eye out on the bottom right corner of Eclipse. You're going to get a little bit of feedback, loading data, building workspace etc. Perhaps you also get in your console some messages here. I'll deal with them in a moment. Just let it load up. What's that? Oh, I selected the, uh, the blank activity. Sorry, empty activity. You can press back and select empty. Yes? Uh, what's that? What's the question? What did it look like again? Oh, right here, yes. Yeah, I didn't hear your question. So you're saying, what is it? Yeah, what is it? Yeah, this is how much memory is being allocated and how much is being used at the moment. Of so we click of your my, system. Of my system? Yeah. Or of what it, the app will be using? Of, uh, of your whole system, it seems to be taking, uh, in my case, 761 megabytes for itself. And then right now, Eclipse is so far using that much. So this is what Eclipse needs. This isn't exactly what your app needs. Okay. All right, so eventually, does, did everyone get some sort of screen here that got even more cluttered? <laughs> All right, so now we've got actual stuff to look at. So let's take one more look at everything that we see here. At the left side, it, it created a, our new project, Test 1. And this just cracks me up that we created a brand new project from scratch, and it already has a warning. Now, this was not happening until the most latest versions of Android SDK. When I was teaching this class, you know, I think at the beginning of the summer or and the on the spring semester, when it was a when it was a couple of versions back, this would not happen. So again, this is this stuff that's rough around the edges. Like why why creating an app from scratch? Do we get already get a warning? And something new that's being added is this app compat v7, which is also because of the new version. So maybe that's why. Yeah, the cynical me is that maybe that's why uh, Google is eventually going to be pushing about get the Android App Studio. Ours doesn't have problems. So, I don't know. We've got some, prob some warnings with it. Remember, warnings, you can still run the project. And you might see some more detailed warnings under the console here. Enable to write jar list. If you get warnings or not, don't worry just yet. If you go over to problems, here it says I've got two warnings. Again, don't worry about the warnings yet, but it's telling you what file and what line number, a Java problem. Don't worry just yet. Um, so now, on the right side, we've got um, an outline, so it shows us that there's some text on screen. Uh, 
Let me zoom in here. It's pretty small. But do you see that this is a preview of your app? And there's the icon that we made and the name of the app. And this is Hello World. I never typed Hello World, but it's got the default classic text. And then on the right side, we can uh, select that object. And it's got various properties of it here, like that it uses a string and other stuff. Don't worry about changing anything just yet. And then what I see on this main area here, in my case, it loaded up two files, main activity.java, and there seems to be that's the warning, and activity main XML, which is also found right here. Activity main XML inside the layout, inside res, I think that stands for resources, and then your project. So this is an XML file, which is similar or reminiscent of HTML, and and I'm seeing the graphical representation of it. Notice at the bottom, this is this tab here, and it's got its own sub-tabs right here. Graphical layout. Switch to activity main. There's the code. So this code is being translated into this graphical layout. It's kind of like when we've got our HTML code in Notepad, and then we run it in the web browser. And so this is XML code, it vaguely reminiscent of HTML, but but different. So let's say I wanted to see this project. Um, in my virtual device or real device. So far we've only got a virtual device. So let's go, the, go through the process of actually running it. Notepad was easy, we just would run launch Firefox. Here we need to create a run configuration. Because we can deploy the same project in a 7-inch tablet and in a 3-inch phone. So we need a run configuration. Um, if you're looking at my notes, we've done the section of Create Basic Android App, and now we're about to do run, Create a Run Configuration. So here's what we need to do. Um, I would recommend up here under... Remember, you can either do it under the Run menu or under the Run icon. I think it's going to be easier to do under the Run icon. But under this triangle next to Run, you want to select Run Configurations. We've got a bunch of uh, filters on the left side here. How do we want to run our project? Is it going to be an Android project, a Java uh, desktop app, a C++ type of app? It's listed here. Is it going to be an Android app? So double-click Android application. And it gives us a new configuration. And this is where we can create more than one configuration so that we have a menu that says run on virtual device, run on real device, run on my tablet, run on my Nexus. We create configurations. At the top here, well, what's the name of the configuration? New configuration. I'm just going to say run 3.2 inch AVD. That's the AVD that I created, and I recommend to make these things mm, memorable or, or take advantage of writing a good name here because when you, once you start working with a bunch of apps or AVDs or real devices, you're going to have a list of possible run configurations, and at a glance you'll be able to tell which is which. So here this is going to tell me that I'm going to run this on a 3.2 inch AVD. Easy. Which project? Well, under Project here, you can browse. We've only got one project, so double-click it. Test one. And then you've got tabs here. Android, Target, Common. Switch to Target. By default, it says automatically pick compatible device. I don't like that because it never guesses what I want. I might have 
a, a real device plugged in and a virtual device because I'm testing two different things. And it never seems to know which of those two to choose. I want it to let me choose. So what do you think we want to activate here instead? Always prompt. Ask me when I run this, what's the right device? Yes, we could activate it here, but again, we could have four ABDs. So select always prompt to pick device. At this point, go ahead and click apply, and then run. What will pop up then is uh, your device chooser. If we had more than one running device, either virtual or real, they'll be listed there. Once we do next time when we set up our real device, it'll say right there, um, LG 730. So I can select my real device. It's not set up, so it doesn't. If I have any uh, virtual devices that are dormant, I can activate them here. I can run them and then wait and then act and then select them. So this screen will allow you to switch between devices. That's cool. Let's say over and over we're going to use this device. So here's a time saver. Use the same device for future launches. I'm not going to turn it on just yet, but keep that in mind. That way I can easily go back to the menu up here. Run AVD, run AVD, run AVD. And it won't pop up here anymore because it knows that I want that AVD once I pick it the first time. In any event, go ahead and select it, click OK. You get something that says monitor, auto monitor log cat. So this is, uh, this is sort of like the console to give you a bunch of feedback. Uh, the default is yes, but I'm going to select no. If you already selected yes and clicked OK, that's OK. Next time put no. Because what's going to happen is you're going to get a, a new panel right here and a constantly running string of feedback. Everything that your device is doing, every click, even things when you're not interacting with it, that it's connecting to the cell tower and all of that. Just a constantly running string of, of feedback. So I've selected no, don't monitor it, I can look at it elsewhere. Click OK. Switch to your virtual device. It doesn't pop up automatically, you have to switch to it. And then you get the actual app in the virtual device. If it didn't pop up automatically, maybe your device was asleep and you have to unlock it. There's your device, or there's your app. Nothing really fancy happens here. It's just a proof of concept. It works. But we can do this. Go home. Click the home button. Let's look at the app launcher, and then go look at, alphabetically, the next screen, test01. It's there, like a real app. Like a real device, a real Android device, what if I want to customize and put my most used app on the home screen? You can tap and hold, keep holding, and then choose to put it on your desktop, your home screen. There we go. So now my virtual device has the app installed and it's on quick launch on my home screen. So I want to remove it from there like a real device. Tap and hold it again. Put it up to remove. That just removed it from the home screen. It's still in the apps here. But you could, in here, tap and hold, uninstall just like a real, real app. Okay, um, as I said, uh, this class goes until 9.30, but we usually wrap up at 9 to do a little bit of lab time and such. I want to do a couple more things. 
And we're not going to get another break because then our break eats up into the time I want to work on, and then we're going to end at 9. So this will be a little bit more to do here. We've already gone an hour and 10, but a little bit more. Um, right now, our, our project, our app, says, Hello world. I wanted to say something else. I wanted to say, hello, Victor, for example. Let's explore that for a bit. Remember, I'm not going to close my virtual device, but what I'm going to do usually is go home. Just take your virtual device back home. And back to Eclipse. I want to change that text. And what this is telling me, if you, if you select it, the outline over here is telling me this is a string. In a sense, it's uh, sort of a variable in that I have a little container that holds that text. I could grab one of these widgets over here and drop a text widget and just write my text. A better way, though, is to use a, a variable. Just like when we talked in the previous class, we can use variables to hold content. That's what's been set up for us here. We've got a variable called hello world. It's a string, and that's the text inside there. Let me show you where you can find that. On the left side, in our package explorer, inside of the res folder. That should already be open. If it's not, go ahead and open it. And then you'll have a folder called uh, values. Open the values folder. And then there's an XML file called strings. This is where it collects all of your strings, all of your variables that you can use throughout your app. So double click strings XML. And this shows it to us in two ways again, either as a graphical representation with nice icons or as a text representation with the raw code. So let's look at both. Everyone sees this as resources. I wish that one would call it, you know, graphical view, code view. But the, these tabs have different names often. Notice if you, if you if you're in resources and you click once on the hello world string, it says the value inside of it is hello world. Don't, don't change it yet. But if we want to look at the same data in, the, in code, it's switched to strings down here. Select your strings tab at the bottom. Here's your code. And let's say I wanted to change the line number where that code is at. By default, Eclipse is not showing me line numbers. Let's fix that, so switch to your strings, the, the code view. And then on this gray area here, right-click, show line numbers. We'll have to turn that on every time we come in, but this is where you find it. Right-click on the gray strip there, show line numbers. There we go. So line 5 is the text representation of the pretty interface right here. And notice what it's saying. Okay, it's XML, so a string tag was invented, because XML is basically about inventing tags as necessary and, and using them as necessary. And so here a, there's a string tag, and it has the attribute of name, and the name is hello world. So you can sort of think about this in a way that it's a variable with the name of hello world. And what's inside the variable is what's inside the tags. So if you wanted it to say hello Victor, go ahead and type that. Or your name. So on line 5 I'm editing that only inside of the tags. And it's telling me I've edited line 5. I haven't saved recently. That's what that red tells me. Something has changed and it has not been saved. As soon as you save, the red goes away. 
So if you go up here and save, get saved. So okay, <clears throat> we added the code easily. And the way the reason I did it here is because to avoid an issue that often happens to beginners of these classes, which is this. If you go back to the resources view, beginners often do this. You select the hello world and you change the name. That's changing the variable name. That's changing the name of the container, not what's in the container. The value is what we needed to change, not the name of the of the container. That's why we did it in, in code, because people often see it right here. Hello, Victor. Well, what we've done here is we've created a new name of a new variable that is not referenced anywhere in the app, and it's also malformed. So don't do that. So did you notice that they didn't change the actual text in the library? Yeah, it didn't. Um, I had to actually close it and open it again. Sometimes it doesn't give you the result right away when you switch between views. That's kind of odd. So if yours didn't change, don't worry. What I did was I closed my string file. I saved it, closed it, and then opened it again, and then it and then it saw the change. That's annoying. Yes? Somewhere else in the code it's saying in order to display this bit of code, use the object called hello world. So then over here, this is where it's defined. Hello world. We're still going to keep that variable name, so to speak, but the contents of it are hello victor. And that's what we're seeing here. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to change that. That's the name of the variable. Kind of. What's inside of it is it's what's within the tags. And somewhere else in some other code, somewhere else, it's saying use this string named hello world and put what's ever inside of it on screen. So everyone change that to your name. All right, we want to see the results. Like, like uh, last month, we were saving and running in Firefox. We sort of need to do the same thing here. We need to save. So make sure you save. And then up on these, uh, up on the run button here, if you click the black triangle again, now it'll say the shortcut, run your 3.2 inch AVD. We only need to go to run configurations once when we want to create a run configuration. When we want to run our project every time, hence, we want to select it from the list here. And that's why I'm saying we want to give it a good name, because we could have more than one run configuration if we're running on our real device. It'll show up there. So select that first option there, click on the triangle, run 3.2 inch AVD. Pops up here again about uh, which AVD do you mean? The only one we've got, so now I will select it and click same device. Use same device for future launches. That way it'll just go straight to the AVD without asking me. Make sure you select the AVD, activate Don't Bother Me again, click OK, switch to your AVD. There's my name. So the whole point of today was to talk about what is the software we need, and there's a lot of it. Download it, set it up, there's a lot of steps to set it up. Once we've got all of that foundational stuff, then okay, let's actually get into Eclipse, which is where we're going to do most of our work. Then we created a very, very simple Android project. You can play with other features here, put in a text box and one of these other widget widgets, and just play with it if you want, and then run it. Um, just to get acclimated with Eclipse, we're going to use it extensively. Very important to figure out, well, how do I actually compile my project? How do I run it? We looked at the run configurations on a virtual device. We created virtual devices, the importance of that. 
and uh, a little bit about playing about this is what is an Android app. All of these folders and subfolders and icons and XML files and Java files and classes and all of that, that's an Android project written classically in Java. Uh, when we come back and we keep working, well, we're going to take what we've learned previously and start to write HTML. And that HTML will be translated, in a sense, to Java. And it'll give us our Android app written in, in HTML. Because uh, I forgot to do this at the beginning of the class, but let me check. How many of you have experience in any programming language? Pretty much everyone. Trick question if you took the previous class. How many of you have experience in Java programming language? Pretty good amount of people, uh, but still very low percent. How many have experience in HTML? Well, everyone, if you took the previous class. Before you took the previous class, who had experience in HTML? Still a good show of hands there. So I'm concentrating on this language that a lot of people have had experience with already. Uh, we just need to still learn some more stuff, specifically Cordova, about what is this framework that will allow us to convert our HTML into Java. And so there's still plenty to look at and to learn. You know, I didn't touch on a variety of things. I never dealt with that warning. Don't worry about it. This is just a proof of concept app to show you that, yeah, we install it on an Android device. Your homework is when you come back next time, make sure if you're going to have a real device, bring it and the cable. I don't have any to let anyone borrow, so make sure you bring your cable. It's standard USB cable. Bring it, and then we'll talk about setting up our device. I have a whole sheet of, in sheet of instructions. I suppose what I can do is put more of my instructions there if you want to start looking at them. But again, I'm going to go through them step by step, get into the pitfalls and all of that. Next time, we are going to talk about setting up a real device. And there's a whole page and a tenth of instructions there, because that needs some setup. We're not going to jailbreak your phone or anything like that, but we need to set it up as a developer device. By default, it's set up as a consumer device, which assumes that people are going to go to Google Play and download apps. We're not going to do that. We're going to install an app directly. So we're going to need to poke around a little bit under the settings and activate some things. We're not going to jailbreak it, but we are going to change it to a developer device. We're going to need to install some USB drivers, special USB drivers. And then when all of that is set up, then we can have a run configuration to launch my, ver my, my, my LG 730. And we can see our project in a real device. And you can tell your friends and family, look, I'm an Android developer. There's my app. It says, hello world. But, you know, that's coming up. So any general questions at this point? Yes. On this test 01 app, when we change the string and then we save it, if we didn't do the run, if we just switch to our virtual device and double click on our icon, would we have the new change? Nope. No, we wouldn't. Every time um, we make a change, we need to compile our app again. We need to take all of these disparate, these disparate uh, files and crunch them into one file, a .apk file. And then that file needs to be transferred to the virtual device and installed because it's the latest version. So that's what the run does. That's what the run does. There's no live automatic save and change something here and check the result. You have to run it. And so when you run it, it, it does a couple things on it. it. It actually compiles everything and then transfers it to the virtual device. And then it also double clicks the icon and opens it. Yeah. Reopens. Exactly, and let me show you that here. Uh, you may see it in your console or not. Let's look at this for a moment. Switch to your console, and if you don't see anything meaningful there, you want to then activate here. What sort of console output do you want to see? Go to this icon that looks like a little monitor, click the triangle, and choose Android. So give me Android output. And now you should see a bunch of stuff you never noticed. If you make that larger, it tells you minute by minute, second by second, what's been happening. So this is the last thing that, that I was doing right here. Uh, ADB, uh, okay, so we're launching Android. ADB is running normally, performing this. We're launching that app. See, there's the name that we wrote. Unload, uploading it, the test APK file onto the device, this emulator. We're then installing it, success. We're starting it, we're tapping it to start it. There's a, some sort of warning there we have to deal with, and then actually starting the app, and it and it loads up the main screen. So yeah, that run configure that run does a lot. That's why it's important to 
set up the run configuration, and we'll be doing it several times. Uh, that is, creating different run configurations and using it several times. Yes? Can you show us where you found the scripts file again? Yes, uh, the strings? String. Yes, it was right here. Um, in, inside of your app, there's res folder, and then in res, there's values. And then you'll find strings.xml. So what we've done so far, not mission critical, we're going to start from a different route next time. You don't have to save this, but if you would like to, just to get used to where did this get saved to, let's do this. Uh, I'm going to close these tabs. I'm going to close any file that's open. I've closed my files, but I've still got apps open. Notice these folders are open. You can also right-click one of these uh, apps and select close close project you might get some sort of warning don't worry I got a big red X there don't worry these are dependent of each other right click that one close project close project thank you they're all closed there Looks like they'll close folders and then I'll go file exit it might pop up to tell you, are you sure you want to exit Eclipse? Mine didn't, but it might pop up to tell you that, so just click OK. And let me show you where some of these supporting files ended up. Because as I said, when you d download all of this stuff, there's no installer file, except for Java. So to, to sometimes when you need to start over from scratch, you need to simply delete the folder where you extracted everything to, which is on the C drive. But now that we've used Eclipse and created virtual devices, actually another folder was created elsewhere. You should also remove that folder if you truly want to start over. I'll show you where that is in a moment. So make a note. One place, now it's up to 1.2 gigs. It was 1.10 previously, right? One place to fully uninstall all of this is at the C drive where you extracted your ADT bundle. And then on Windows, the other place is to go to your your user account. Mine is called Instructor. Yours is called Lab. Yours is called John or whatever at home or I don't know family or whatever yours is called. You want to go to your user account, and you'll see a folder there called Workspaces. Workspace. Inside of Workspace is where our current project is at. Let me show you here. User lab, here we go. Workspace, right there. There's our test one. So that's where our project is at. If you wanted to take this home with you, copy that folder. It's not a very interesting project, so you don't have to. But that's where I was saving it to, in the workspace folder in your lab. In here it's lab because that's our username. Whatever your username is at home. The other thing you want to make a note of is in your in your user folder. Now there's a folder called .android. And in my case that takes up, you know, a few kilobytes, maybe megabytes or whatever. And that folder also, if you were going to uninstall and redo everything, you want to delete that folder because that has the definition for your AVD and other Eclipse stuff. So there's a .android folder in your user folder. See that's, oh, there we go, 500 megabytes. So the virtual device itself, because it needs some uh, SD card memory space and internal space and RAM and all of that, this is like a mini computer running in your computer, 500 megabytes. You don't need to save anything from there, but I'm just letting you know if you're going to start all over, make sure to delete that folder as well. <coughs> 